Hey everybody, we're back. Thank you so much for joining us. We are in session eight, our final session on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm so excited you've been with us for this series. I pray and know that it's been a blessing on your life. I pray that you ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to baptize you, to empower you to make a difference in your Christian walk, in your walk with Jesus Christ. If you've not been baptized in water, if you've not been saved at the cross, if you've not given your heart to Jesus, you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, meet Jesus at the cross. Meet him in the water. Meet his spirit in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to dive in tonight. Grab your Bible. Grab your notes. Grab something to write with. Grab your coffee, your water. I'm drinking hot tea tonight with some lemon in it or some honey. And uh, so I just want to say this. I want to say if you need notes, go to our website, whitestonechurchtx.com. Contact us. We'll be happy to add you to our ever-growing mailing list, and we'll send you out the notes. We have Bible studies. This is our fourth one now. So if you've missed any of them, go to our YouTube channel on the same name, whitestonechurchtx.com, and um, go to our playlist. You can. Uh, we've done Bible studies on Revelation, on the book of Revelation, on hell, on uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit, is Jesus God, and some other topics. And so, thank you so much. Let's pray. Let's dive in and get started. So, Father God, we love you. God, we bless you. God, we take authority of the name of Jesus, God. And we bring hope to the world, Father. We bless you and we praise you, God. We take the name of Jesus with authority to bring hope to the world. And so, Father, fill us with your presence. Holy Spirit, fill us tonight online, whether we're walking, shopping, working, whatever we're doing, God, let us know that you are with us. And so Holy Spirit, lead us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. If you don't know it by heart, memorize it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, and ye shall receive power. Say power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Just four verses earlier, Jesus told his disciples that he trained for three and a half years. His personal best friends, his A-team, he said, wait, don't go do ministry yet. Don't go preach yet. Don't go start churches. Don't go uh, start uh, 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 children's homes. Don't, don't go do anything. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever stepped before God? Have you ever stepped out to do something in your own strength? Have you ever tried to do something good for God in your own ability? Whether it was hire a new staff member for the church, whether it was going out next door and telling your neighbor or trying to, to tell your loved one about Jesus before the right time, Jesus says, wait, just wait, and I'll give you power. Wait for the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to recap a little bit tonight. Hebrews chapter 6 says this, it says, Therefore, let's leave elementary principles of Christ, and let's go on to perfer perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, or the doctrine of baptisms. So there are multiple baptisms listed in Scripture. Most of the time when we say baptism, we just think baptism of water, which is which is the second progression in our walk with Christ. It's vital. If you've not been water baptized as a grown-up, as a person who chose it for themselves, not, not don't just say, well, I was baptized as an infant. That's great that mom and dad chose that for you, but have you chosen it? And so after you meet Jesus at the cross, we got to get water baptized. But then many believers stopped there, but Jesus didn't. It says when he came up out of the water, then the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. The day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God descended upon the church with hurricane force, with great might of a rushing wind. And so God says, meet him in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then there's a baptism of fire. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter tells the, the Jewish people there, repent let every one of you be baptized. So repent means meet Jesus at the cross. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive. Say, I shall receive. 
you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to repent. We need to be water baptized. We need to receive. That's a three-step progression. John the Baptist in Matthew says, Listen, I baptize with water, but one greater than I, who I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals, named Jesus, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to saturate me, to move on me, to fill me every day of my life. I want to move in the Holy Ghost. I don't want to move in religion any longer. Cameron's operated in religious long in religion long enough. I've operated out of good, uh, you know, good man-made theology long enough. I'm, I want to just move the rest of my days in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you want the same. I pray that you want to move in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you'll lay hands on sick people in HEB. You won't care who's listening. You won't care. What, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you'll raise your hands in church and shout hallelujah, and you won't care who's listening. When you're moved in the Holy Spirit, you'll shut your mouth when you even, even when you have the answer because the Holy Spirit says, nope, don't cast your pearls before pigs. Listen, when you're moving in the Holy Spirit, you'll speak to mountains. You won't ask God to do it. You'll do it. When you're moving in the Holy Spirit, you'll bind generational spirits, generational curses off of your family, and you'll break that chain of sin or addiction. When you move in the power of the Holy Spirit, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, when you're immersed, when you're saturated with the Spirit of God, you will do things that you would not, could not do without his power. Jesus says this, the, or the New Testament says this. It says, be not drunk with wine, which leads to sin, but be drunk on the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, when you drink too much alcohol or you get under the influence of alcohol, Many times people do things they would not normally do when they're sober. So God says, hey, listen, don't go do something under the influence of alcohol that leads to sin. Be drunk or be filled, be moved and go do something under the power of the Holy Ghost that you would never do if you were, quote unquote, sober in the spirit. God saying, I'm looking for men and women to pour my spirit out into. I'm looking for thirsty souls. I'm looking for open hearts. I'm looking for minds that are willing to allow me to change them from the inside out. Water baptism, spirit baptism, fire baptism. The baptism of fire is the sanctification, is the sanctification process. It's purification. It's the process of holiness. Say holiness. Listen, so many of us have bought this bumper sticker religion that just says, hey, if I say the magic prayer, I get in the water, I'm good. I got my ticket. I'm going to heaven. God doesn't want anything else from me. I checked the box. I, I got saved. Listen, that's the start of the relationship, but that's similar to a man and a wife at an altar uh, saying, I do. That's that's not the totality of their marriage. That's just the beginning of their marriage. They they have no idea the adventure to come, the, the good, the bad, the ugly. They don't, they don't know what's going to happen. But listen, that's the start of the adventure. So this baptism of fire is this purifying. It's the burning away of your greed, the burning away of your pride, the burning away of your uh, your will versus God's will. It's the burning away. It's the purification. It's the holiness factor. When you get baptized by fire, God starts to consume things in your life. Let's look at, at Acts chapter 2 in regard to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter, or the, the baptism of fire. Acts chapter 2, verses 1, two, uh, verses one and 2 and now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in accord in one place. And suddenly, say suddenly, 
there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Listen, there is an anointing. There is a fire in your belly. There is a baptism of fire that God has put something burning in you. His word burns in your soul. It burns inside of you. There is something on fire in you. When you read this verse, it says each one of them got their own fire. God doesn't just universally blanket his church. We're not all supposed to be evangelists like Billy Graham. We're not all supposed to be healers like T.D. Jakes. We're not all supposed to, to, to or Oral Roberts. We're not all supposed to, to be missionaries. We're not all supposed to be uh, um, worshipers like Stacy Corbin. We're not all supposed to just be the same. We are to move in our own anointing, our own fire. Your anointing may take you to Wall Street. Your anointing may take you to the Supreme Court. Your anointing may take you to the classroom of th with three-year-olds. Your anointing, like my mom, may allow you to raise over 10,000 children. My parents reached over 10,000 easily children and families for the Lord because the anointing of caretaking was on them, the anointing of wisdom, the anointing of, of the prophetic. Whatever your anointing is, it's a, it's a baptism of fire. It's something that's going to take you through this process where God says, hey, listen, I don't want you to practice law just to make a lot of money. I want you to go practice law for free for those who are on death row or for those who can't afford it or, or for that ministry that needs a good attorney. I don't know what God's calling you to, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you something. David said, hey, listen, I'm not going to sacrifice to God if it doesn't cost me something. There's a baptism of fire. John 16 uh, tells us this. John 16, 7. It, it, this is a powerful verse. Again, I, I could say it a hundred times, and I still can't grasp it. Jesus is with his best friends, his disciples. And he's been dropping hints for about a year. Hey, listen, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. I won't be with you forever in the flesh. Now, these guys, they, they're like you and I. They heard it, but they didn't hear it. They, they heard what Jesus was saying, but they didn't comprehend it because they had their own agenda. Their agenda was that Jesus would destroy Rome, take over Caesar, de defeat Caesar, get Pontius Pilate out of their territory, establish a physical uh, uh, kingdom with a physical throne <clears throat> similar to King David, who uh, they grew up reading the Old Testament, seeing what King David did, Solomon, the, these godly kings. They knew the Messiah was coming to establish his kingdom. Now, in their finite minds, all they could imagine was a kingdom on earth. You and I have the same struggle. God gives us a word. He gives us a prophetic. He gives us a calling. And we put him in this box of, well, God, if you're going to do this, it's got to be done this way. And God's like, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. So Jesus tells his best friends this in John chapter 16, verse 7. He says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Jesus is saying that I ascend to heaven. If I do not go, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, Jesus, long before Pentecost ever takes place, Acts chapter 2, he is prophesying this to his guys. He's prophesying, saying, hey, listen, there's the Holy Spirit that's going to come. And he's going to fill you. It's going to be to your advantage. Well, here, here's, the, here's the disadvantage of Jesus on earth, if you will. The disadvantage was Jesus chose to give up his throne and to in, inhabit a body. So Jesus, the man, is fully God, yet fully human. So Jesus, the man, had to eat. He had to sleep. He had to walk or ride a donkey or, you know, go somewhere 
with physical constraints. He didn't fly around. He didn't call down angels and say, hey, I want to go to this city four miles away and I'm tired today, so just, just transport me over there. He chose to give up those, those privileges, if you will, and simply followed the Holy Spirit. John Bevere wrote a book, and I highly suggest it. It's in our, it's in our notes. It's called The Holy Spirit. And, and, and in that book, there, there, it brings this out to a much bigger degree than, than I can speak on it tonight. But, but here's the reality. Jesus could only minister to so many people in one day, in one 24-hour cycle. Because if he got up at 5 a.m. and went to bed at 10 p.m., uh, he could only minister to, say, 200 people that day if he gave all of them three to four minutes of time. But he, he had to eat. He had to go to the restroom. He had to rest. He, had to, he, had, he was physical. And so when Jesus says, hey, it's to your advantage that I go away, he's saying, listen, I'm not going to leave you, but I'm now going to fill you with my spirit. I'm going to baptize you with my Holy Spirit. And so now you and I have the same opportunity, the same access to God the Father. We have the same access through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, listen, I need you to heal blind eyes. I need you to walk on water. Hey, listen, in fact, you plus you plus you plus you, you're going to do more than I ever could have done on this earth. So God's saying he didn't leave us here in 2020 with just good morals and good ethics and, and good historical uh, understanding and, and Greek definitions of words. and Man, he didn't leave us with a religion. He left us with a relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, I want to say this. I have a, I have a prop tonight. It's, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorites. There's a Bible verse in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 14. It says, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Say the word Redeemer. I've, all, I've never really understood what that word Redeemer meant, but Jesus is our Redeemer. The enemy has lied to some of us and said, listen, God can't use me the way that he uses that preacher, or God can't use me the way, God's never going to use me to open blind eyes. God's not going to, I've prayed for the gift of tongues, and God's just not going to give that to me. I, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, I'm not going to move in confidence because my history is horrible. I've, I, I, I've, I've got seven divorces on my record. I've got three bankruptcies in my past. Uh, I've got 28 years served in 14 different penitentiaries uh, uh, in my past. Uh, listen, I went to college. I had a free ride. I blew it, man. I, I, I wasted my opportunity. God, God's just put me on, on, on uh, uh, cruise control for the rest of my life. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Let me pull this out. Um, anybody remember old school Coke bottles? Now, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, so, but I think most of us will grasp it. Now, this one, this is like Coca-Cola came out a few years back around Christmas, and they, they brought back, like you can still get these at HEB, these little six-ounce Coke bottles, but, but some of you still love the glass bottle of Coke. Um, this one here is, is pretty old. This one was uh, from, well, I shouldn't say pretty old. This one's a little older. It's from 1994 uh, when, when the uh, Texas Rangers built their stadium at Arlington. They came out with a, com a commemorative bottle. So we got, I got some old Coke bottles here. Um, this one here is much, much older. This one here is one from the 80s, and you could just tell by the design, uh, the Coke label, you can see it says money back bottle. Uh, you can just tell that this was, you know, th these are a little bit older, more original. Um, <clears throat> this one here is, is much older. It's, it's from the 70s, 80s. Same thing. Uh, still, I think it's still got some Coke. I don't know if you can see that. Still got some, some, uh, I think it's still got some Coke in it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this one here is, is pretty old. This is from 1979. It was the 75th year uh, Coca-Cola anniversary, and so it's got a cool label on the front. This is a 10-ounce bottle, uh, a little different design, um, but, but you know, so it's cool. Um, this one is from 18, 1984, 
But if you notice, it's still got coke in it, and it still fizzes. It's, it, it's, it's pretty crazy. This had the entire Dallas Cowboys uh, um, season on it, and, you know, this is a Dallas Cowboys. My grandfather collected these, uh, Swin Helgi. Um, got this one here. This one's really old. This is not a Coke one, but this is a Dr. Pepper. It has the original 10, 2, and 4 on it. Uh, old school design. And then this one is that commemorative bottle. Again, I've got like six or seven of these that still have Coke in them. I've always been tempted to pop one and see what it tastes like. But uh, so, so here's my point. I don't know if you were like me, but as a kid, I would go on the hunt for Coke bottles. Yep, in the early 80s, me and my friend Richard Lindsay, uh, Mark Hefner, Chris Keen, Willie Richards, Jimbo Frierson, we would, we would all get on our bikes and we wanted to go to the arcade. And so we would go on the hunt. We wouldn't go do work. I mean, we weren't, we weren't crazy or anything. We wouldn't go do chores uh, or we exhausted all of our chore money. Uh, but we would go hunt for Coke bottles and we would pull them out of our trash cans we would pull them out of our neighbor's trash cans. We would pull Coke bottles out of the creek. We would find Coke bottles that still had partial, uh, they, they had Coke still in them. We would find Coke bottles that were chipped. Uh, we would find Coke bottles that the label was all scratched off of. We would find Coke bottles that were in the creek, covered in mud. We didn't care where we found them. And if we found the bonus ones, like those 32 ounce ones, we, we found like gold. We would even go to our parents, uh, uh, you know, to the, to to where our parents had the Coke bottles and drink them. And here's what we wanted to do: we were on the hunt for these Coke bottles. The reason why there was this really weird word at the bottom of the Coke bottle, and it said this: it said redeemable five cents, or redeemable ten cents, or on the really big ones. It said redeemable 25 cents. Now listen, as a kid, I didn't have any idea what that word R -E -E -D -M -A -B, redeemable. I didn't know what that meant. All I meant, all I knew that it meant was that money, that Coke bottle was worth some money. And if I could get 10 Coke bottles or four of the big ones or whatever the, the, the array of Coke bottles, I would take them down to Skaggs. Now Skaggs was our, our grocery store before Albertsons or Crestview Mini Max, and we would take our Coke bottles to the grocery store. And the person at the cash register would buy them back from us. They didn't say, did you drink them? Because we didn't, we, we stole them from somebody else's house, whatever. They didn't ask, hey, uh, is the label scratched off? Uh, is, man, is that a roach? Remember roaches, they could live in the Coke bottle for like six months. I don't act like you didn't, you didn't ever have that. Yeah, you did. Uh, <clears throat> they didn't ask, hey, you need to get all the mud out of that Coke bottle. The person at, at the grocery store just bought them back because it had that magic word on the bottom, redeemable. So what would happen is Coke would take this bottle. At some point in the week, the delivery guy would show up to the grocery store and he would load up pallet after pallet after pallet of used Coke bottles. And we didn't know it, but we, we, we then understood it as we grew up. The Coke man would take these back to the factory. <coughs> they would wash them, scrub them, shine them, polish them, relabel them, sanitize them, fill them with Coke, fill them with the magic drink, right? Put a cap on it seal it, take it back to the very store and display it and sell it because now it's filled with a new product. See, you may be way ahead of me, but that's our Christian walk. See, some of us, some of us have been in the creek. We were, we were consumed. The world drank us. That guy just sucked us dry. That girl just sucked us dry. They tossed us in the creek when they were done with us and said, you're not valuable. Some of us are scarred. The la our label, our shine is dull. Our, our label is, was, was, 
was was uh, destroyed. Our our reputation, our our dreams, our label, that thing that we were known for was stripped from us. It was it was scarred. It was skewed. It was it was messed up. Some of us we were left. Half use, half, we were thrown away and never reached our full potential. Some of us were were just consumed, so that somebody else could use. Listen, God says, I don't know what condition you're in today. I I, I don't know. I mean, I know. Where, God says, I know where you've been. I know what you've been through. But but I'm not looking at your past. It, come to me. Listen, I'm I've, I sent my son to collect you. I sent my preacher to, to pull you out of the miry clay. I sent my word, my spirit. Listen, I want to take you back to the plant. I want to take you through the blood of Jesus and sanitize you and wash you. I want to I want to take you to the river, Jordan, and I want to I want to wash away your sin. I want to cleanse you. I want you I want you to know that you're worthy of for me to pour my spirit into you. I'm going to pour into you something that somebody else is going to want to consume. And I'm, I'm going to put a cap on you. I'm going to seal you. And I'm going to put you out for display. Listen, get ready because God's going to use you. He's going to place you on the end cap, on the, on the, on the, the best display in the store. Because when he fills you with his spirit, then people will say, I, I want what's inside there. I want what's inside of you. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not so that you get to uh, uh, be filled and you get to be uh, viewed. Oh, you know, I mean, you get to be the one that's the healer and you are the prophet and you are the, the tongue talker and you are the man. Listen, God fills us with his tongues. So, so we could pour it out so other people can drink it in. So that they can, they can go from this empty state to filled with the Spirit, filled with hope, filled with adventure, filled with, with joy, and, and their pain would be washed away. Listen, so many believers are like nostalgic, old, really cool Coke bottles. Man, we, we got a lot of people in our church that, man, we look good. Oh, man. Brother so-and-so, back in the day, man, God, God, oh, this one's so good for the season. You know, oh, they, man, such great potential. But they're, oh, this one's still got a cap on it. I mean, look at that. His, I don't know, if, yeah, I can get that off. The, the, listen, God doesn't want this. He says, listen, I'm going to gather you all up. I'm going to take you back to the plant. I'm going to wash you. I'm going to sanitize you. I'm going to fill you and I'm going to display you so the world will buy what's in you, the Spirit of God. And they're going to drink from you. And then you're going to come back to me and I'm going to fill you again. And they're going to drink from you again. Then you're going to come back to me. Listen, some people that drink from you are going to hurt you. Some people that drink from you are going to throw you away. Some people that drink from you are going to drop you by accident and chip off part of you. Some people that drink from you are not going to care for you. Some people will say, oh, thanks, and they'll put you on a shelf and never drink. There's a lot of people in church that, man, they hear the Word of God, but they never drink from it. They just like to hear it. I don't, I don't know why, but they just like to hear it. They and listen, this is, this is just a simple example of Jesus being our Redeemer. And Jesus wants to redeem us because he wants to fill us with the very Spirit of God that walked through him. And when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, don't let the world tell you, oh, the Holy Spirit's crazy, man. When you get filled, you're going to shake you're going to rattle, you're going to roll, you're going to jump pews, you're going to spit fire. Listen, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But God's not going to do something through you that would ever hurt you. He's not going to do something through you that's going to cause you pain. He's going to fill you with His Spirit. He's going to take away your pride 
And he's going to take away your fear. He's going to fill you with his spirit and pour you out. Can I get an amen? The best thing that could ever happen to you is that you spend the next 25 years of your life, the next 55 years of your life. I don't know how much longer you got. I don't know how much longer I got. But every day when I wake up, if I'll get filled with the Holy Spirit and say, God, by tonight, would you have poured me out? Maybe even three, four, five, six times, God. It's this constant cycle of being emptied, filled, emptied, filled. And the more we do that, the bigger our capacity gets. You used to just be, I, I don't have a great example on that, but you used to just be a little six-ouncer, but now you are now you worked your way up to a 12-ouncer or whatever, you know, and, and, and God's going to just pour into you and pour into you and pour into you so that you'll go pour yourself out to others. Can I get an amen? Listen, God is your Redeemer. Jesus sees your value. The Holy Spirit has a character. He has a will. He has a mind. He has emotions. He has he speaks, he teaches, he chooses. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. The crazy thing is, is that can God do anything? Yes, he can. But can you resist him? Yes, you can. The Bible says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Listen, he's talking to some Jewish so-called God followers. <coughs> Don't let that be said of you. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot fill you if you're upside down. He's not even going to try. This is leaking. I don't know what's in here. He, he, he's not even going to try. He's going to wait for you to say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Fill me up. Amen? Listen, God's got a plan for you. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's on, it's on like page four of your notes. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And, and I just realized this word like a month ago, teaching this class. I was like, oh, never saw that before. Verse 7. The manifestation. Say manifestation. The manifestation of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. So many of us pray, oh Lord, give me tongues. Man, listen, tongues are great, but tongues is a gift. The, the gift is the Holy Spirit. So to know that, that, that you've got the Holy Spirit, you know that you've got the gifts. you got them all. God's going to then bring them out of you. He's then going to manifest them out of you. So to say that you want the gift of tongues, what we're really saying is, I want the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when you get the Holy Spirit, you're going to get healings. You're going to get discernment. You're going to get prophecy. You're going to get knowledge. You're going to get wisdom. You're going to get interpretation of tongues. You're going to get tongues. You are going to then start to speak like you've never spoken. You're going to do like you've never done. Because in the natural, you can't fulfill the mandate of the Holy Spirit. But through the Holy Spirit, he'll manifest himself. So that word manifest means to bring out, to show. to I'm going to manifest this thing. <clears throat> Listen, the Holy Spirit wants to manifest words of wisdom. Sometimes when we say, well, these gifts, they don't exist anymore. Does wisdom still exist? Yes. James 1, he who needs wisdom, let him ask and God will get. Listen, wisdom, it's a gift. This wisdom here is supernatural wisdom. This knowledge here is supernatural. Faith, healings, miracles, prophecy, <laughs> discerning the spirits, speaking in tongues, the interpretation of tongues. God is going to do stuff through you that you will never be able to do on your own. You need these gifts because they are weapons of warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the destruction of strongholds. God's going to use you. He's going to pour out in you. He's going to pour out. Listen, 
just like in this Coke bottle, when God starts to use you, don't don't cast your pearls to the pigs. Don't don't just go out and say, here, here's the spirit. Of Listen, go where God's telling you to pour into people. Go, let's don't lay hands on sick people till God tells you to. Don't don't go preaching down on Sixth Street till God tells you to. Don't go do wait on the power. Wait on that power. Because there's a time and a place. There's an anointing. There's a baptism of fire for you. Y'all are getting me fired up tonight. Listen. Um, the laying on of hands. We don't talk about this one very much. But the laying on of hands. Listen. Um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes through the laying on of hands. So if you desire the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just as you need somebody to baptize you in water, let a godly man or woman baptize you through the laying on of hands. Now listen, that person is just being obedient, but Jesus is the one that baptizes. See, the cool thing is man can baptize with water, but Jesus, via a person, via the Spirit of God, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Just seek the laying on of hands. Um, Acts chapter 8. Then they laid hands on them. They received the Holy Spirit. So much so a guy named Simon says, Hey man, here's some money. Uh, let me pay you money. Give me that power, man. When I lay hands on people, I want them to receive. Listen, it's not a show. It's not a show. And, and he gets put in his place. Um, but the power of laying on of hands. The, uh, the, the last part of it uh, is is the baptism of fire. And I just want to bring up one other point. Um, baptism of fire is that um, Isaiah 6. Isaiah is standing before God. An angel, a seraphim, actually, takes a coal from the altar of God and places it on his lips, a burning coal. It's this Old Testament shadow or type of, of baptism of fire, this purging away. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And so he's purging away that, that, that sin through fire. Um, the baptism of fire, uh, I, I love it because when you get on fire for Jesus, when you start to allow the Spirit of God to burn out of you impurities, um, all of hell will know. Acts 19 is this... It's not funny, but it's, it's a little bit funny. This guy's going to cast out this demon, and the demon turns on him and says, Hey, I know who Paul is. I know who Jesus is, but who are you? See, when you get filled with the Spirit of God, and he starts to purge out of you all the, all the, the stuff that trips us up, hell starts to take notice so that when you speak, hell has to obey in the name of Jesus. God wants you to be a threat to the enemy. The days are the lie of, if I leave the devil alone, he'll leave me alone. That's a lie from the pit. He's already got a bullseye on your back. He's out to kill, steal, and destroy you. He's been doing it since the day you were <clears throat> in your mama's belly. Listen, it's time to turn and say, uh-oh, Johnny is getting out of bed. Uh-oh, Susie's getting out of bed. Uh-oh, Teresa's praying. Uh-oh, uh, Mark's over there witnessing to his boss. Uh-oh. Bob's over there laying hands on sick people. Uh-oh. Kelly's over there uh, preaching on the gospel uh, the, uh, uh, at the corner. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, Randy's over there starting a business and he's going to use the proceeds for my glory. Uh-oh. So-and-so's building a church. Listen. Be a threat. You can't be a threat with religion. And you can't be a threat in the physical. It comes through the supernatural. 2 Timothy 3 says, We have a form of godliness, but we deny its power. Listen, the baptism of the fire, Jesus says this. He says, his winnowing fan is in his hand. This is out of Matthew chapter 3. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Listen, there's a lot of fake uh, and, and I do it too. I'm not pointing fingers. There's a lot of fake Christianity. And God says, listen, Cameron, let's prune that out of your life. 
those little those little cookie cutter prayers that you're praying, Cameron. Yeah, we're gonna cut those out. You're gonna pray for real now. Listen, those little cookie cutter uh, devotional quiet times that you're having on your way to work, uh, we're we're gonna cut that out. You're gonna get into you're gonna get deep into my word. Hey, listen, that little uh, when you're tipping me and not tithing, we're gonna, we're gonna cut out tipping God. You're gonna start tithing to God. We're we're gonna start using you for real. Listen, God is taking you to a new place. It's 2020. This year has been unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, God is doing a new thing. Isaiah 43, can we not see it? Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not see it? I've been saying this, like the guy that prayed for his sick kid in the New Testament. He said, God, I believe. He said, Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. I'm like, Jesus, I can see, but help where I can't see. God, you're making a way through the wilderness and you're bringing streams through the desert. God is returning. Jesus Christ is returning. He's returning sooner and quicker and more and different than you ever thought. He's not coming back the way that we all anticipate. It's going to be something we're going to go, oh, we're going to be just like the disciples. That's what you meant by you're going to return. Oh, okay. Uh, listen, he's coming back. The economy is... You can't trust it. The uh, ways of the government, the, the media, the ways of man, the vibe on the street. Listen, we can't trust in those things. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is time for you to seriously ask yourself the question. If you died right now, would you die and go to heaven? If you say, well, I think so, I, I appreciate your honesty. If you say, well, you know, I'm not real sure. I, I, listen, let's know for sure. Go to the cross of Jesus Christ. Get on your knees and say, oh, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Baptize me with your blood. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Go get water baptized. Get someone to lay hands on you and pray the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord to baptize you with fire. And say this, Lord, send me. I'm willing to go. I'm ready to go. Every dollar in my bank account. Lecrae has a song. He did, he did it with Dave Crowder uh, called Shadows. And he says, every dollar in my bank account is in pursuit of you, Jesus. Every ounce of my thought life is in pursuit of holiness. My entertainment's in pursuit of holiness. My agenda, my personal gain is in, in, in pursuit of, of making Jesus famous. God's ready to use you. He's not looking across the street. He's not saying, oh, I'm going to use Pastor Cameron only. No, come on. God is going to use you to reach your neighbor. God's going to use you to reach aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so and nephew and nieces Nobody else can reach him but you. God's releasing to you. He's pulled you out of the trash can. He pulled you out of, of that addiction. He's pulled you out of whatever that is. He's washed you. He's cleansed you. He's sanitized you. He's filled you with his spirit. And now he's ready to display you. Let him display you. Let him take you to people that need you. I love you. I appreciate you. I want you to know that God's got his hand on you. And I'm excited about what God's going to do. Would you just allow God to use you like never before? Amen? Amen. Don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. Allow the Spirit of God to lead you. Don't go do anything till first the Spirit of God says, step here. My friend says, well, the Bible says, he reminds me, he says, Cameron, you, you planned your steps, but God ordered them. God's ordered your steps. Father God, we love you. God, we bless you. God, we praise you. Father, I pray that everybody in the sound of my voice would realize that you've redeemed them. God, you brought them out and you filled them new. 
and you're ready to use them in a mighty way. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much. We'll see you again Thursday night. We're going to start a new study. Um, I'm still praying about it, but I think it's going to be good. So just join us Thursday, 6.30, same place, same time here on Facebook Live. God bless you. Get ready. You're going to win. God's going to do something big. Thank you. See you next time.